In the skies over southern France, a Boeing 707 is battling severe turbulence. All seems well first, but suddenly, the aircraft rolls to the right violently. In a fierce descent with tons of alarms blaring, the crew of the 707 struggles to regain control of their stricken aircraft. Soon, they are spotted by observers on the ground, but to their horror, the aircraft seems to be severely damaged, with one wing being on fire. Will they make it back to the ground? Let's find out in this video. Welcome to Airspace. On March 31st, 1992, Trans Air Flight 671 had just departed Luxembourg for a flight to Kano, Nigeria. The Boeing 707 was carrying 38 tons of freight, as well as 116,000 pounds or 52,600 kilograms of fuel. The crew was composed of three men, a Swedish captain, a British first officer and a British flight engineer. Two passengers were on board as well, a maintenance technician as well as a cargo supervisor. The aircraft they operated was a Boeing 707, a plane that was already in its later stages of its life cycle. It had been delivered to Pan American Airways in 1964, so it was already 28 years old in 1992. But the age of the four engine aircraft spelled no trouble for the experienced crew on that day. Led by Captain Ingemar Berglund, the crew was privileged to have a captain with over 26,000 flight hours and a lot of flying experience on different aircraft. In his younger years, Captain Berglund had served as a fighter pilot in the Swedish military. The 44-year-old first officer named Martin Emery too was a very experienced individual, sporting over 14,000 hours in the air. At first, the flight was rather uneventful, save for some light turbulence. But soon, as the aircraft approached the southern French coast near the town of Martigues, the ride became a lot bumpier. On that day, a rather deep low pressure area was situated over Great Britain, covering Western Europe. This brought unsettled weather to the area, characterized by thunderstorms and rain showers. In addition to that, a strong jet stream formed at the edge of this low pressure area. Jet streams are high altitude bands of insanely strong winds. They are prevalent all over the globe and are a major driver of the global weather systems. On some days, they can reach wind speeds of over 200 knots, that is 230 miles per hour or 370 kilometers per hour. On the day of the accident, the jet stream over France blew at a speed of just 90 knots, which is a rather moderate and common speed for a jet stream. On its edge, however, it induced severe turbulence as the fast winds created vortices with the surrounding air mass. Just as Transair Flight 671 reached the southern coast of France while flying at 29,000 feet, it encountered first areas of turbulence. To get out of those, the crew requested and was granted clearance to climb to 33,000 feet. But alas, the turbulence became worse and worse. Suddenly, as the crew was experiencing severe turbulence, they heard a double bang. The aircraft rolled to the right violently. Immediately, Captain Berglund disengaged the autopilot and struggled to keep control by countering the rolling motion with the yoke and the rudder pedals. To make matters worse, a continuous fire warning sounded through the cockpit. According to the visual warnings presented, this corresponded to a fire on engine number 4, the rightmost engine. A short time later, a visual warning lit up to report a fire on engine number 3 as well. Puzzled, the crew noted that the throttles of these engines had moved forwards on their own. The cockpit noise level was dominated by the engine fire warning that the flight engineer could not switch off, despite the fact that he repeatedly attempted to do so. Another warning system sounded at the same time, to indicate that the cabin was losing pressure and fast. All these warnings continued blaring and could not be cancelled, creating a pandemonium of sound. While he struggled with all his might, the captain managed to wrangle the Boeing 707 back in control. He was able to level the wings, reduce power on the engines and put the aircraft in a descent. Now, the search for the source of the troubles began. The aircraft's warning systems indicated that indeed, not one but two engines seemed to be on fire, a highly unlikely and rare scenario. Immediately, the flight engineer began trying to put out the fire by cutting fuel to the engines and discharging the engine-mounted fire extinguishers. But as soon as the first officer looked out of the window, it quickly dawned on him where all the strange warnings were coming from. As he turned back to his colleagues, I can only imagine how they must have felt as the first officer said, Engine 4 is gone, it has separated from the wing. In fact, both engines are gone. Immediately, he sent out a mayday call. 
The crew recovered quickly from their initial shock. Thinking quickly, the flight engineer suggested lightening the aircraft by dumping fuel to help make the aircraft more maneuverable. The captain immediately agreed. While the first officer was in charge of radio communications and determining the cause and extent of the aircraft's damage, the captain, who was struggling at the flight controls, asked for the meteorological conditions in Marseille and ordered a gear extension. The flight engineer, helped by the maintenance man, extended the gear according to the emergency drill and continued dumping fuel. In the meantime, the first officer checked that the emergency drill recommended in case of engine separation was in progress and, still being in charge of the ATC communications, attempted to obtain the meteorological conditions in Marseille. At the captain's request, the first officer specified to air traffic control that they were capable of only limited maneuvering. He also found a short window of time to snap a picture of the destroyed wing, as is mentioned in the final report. Unfortunately, I was unable to find it anywhere on the internet. Suddenly, an airfield appeared ahead through the clouds, and the first officer asked air traffic control for its identification. This airfield proved to be the Istre military field. The appearance of this airfield was a stroke of luck for the crew, as it was closer than Marseille and it offered a longer runway too. Air traffic control cleared the stricken Boeing 707 to land there without delay. The aircraft approached the airport from the west and had to perform one last turn to align with runway 15. This last turn must have been a huge effort for the captain, because he could be heard straining as the first officer encouraged him six times to turn left, turn left. During this last turn, the tower controller informed the crew that the aircraft was on fire, but received no response, as the pilots were very busy flying the plane. Finally, the aircraft touched down on the runway at high speed and slightly to the left of the center line. The first officer and the flight engineer helped the captain during this difficult phase. But it seemed that the emergency was not over after they had landed. Flying down the runway at 190 knots, that's almost three times the speed of a car on the highway, the captain called out that the hydraulic brakes were no longer working. Without delay, the flight engineer activated the pneumatic emergency brake system, which resulted in successful braking action, but also led to a left main gear tire burst. Also, the flight engineer selected the maximum reverse power on engine number 2. All this helped to slow down the aircraft, but after a 2300 meter ground roll, it went off the left side of the runway and stopped 250 meters further on, heading approximately 90 degrees from the runway axis. Immediately, the fire crews in attendance attacked the fire. Relieved that they were on the ground, all crew members evacuated the aircraft through the cockpit windows with the help of escape ropes. The two passengers went out through the front left door. Only when the crew evacuated from the aircraft did they realize that the right wing was on fire. It appeared that the first officer never heard the remark of the air traffic controller. 24 minutes after the two right engines had separated, the aircraft was finally on the ground. The fire continued to rage fiercely and required over 40,000 liters or 10,500 gallons to be doused. After the charred wreckage had cooled down sufficiently, investigators soon set out to inspect the broken 707. A search for the missing engines was launched as well. They were quickly found in a remote area in southern France. Luckily, their impact had not harmed anyone. Despite the fact that the engines had been badly mangled when they hit the ground, investigators were able to tell that they had worked properly until the very moment they had separated from the 707. But why did they do so? When investigators took a closer look at the engine mounting points of engine number 3, they discovered cracks that looked suspicious. One of those cracks was even of a black color, indicating that it must have persisted for a long time. A black discoloration usually is a sign of oxidation, which can take a lot of time. Investigators were able to identify these cracks as fatigue cracks, most probably originating from the repeated stresses imposed on the metal as the engine accelerated and decelerated. When the attachment finally failed, the remaining other three attachment points were no longer able to sustain the load of the engine. Most probably, the severe turbulence encountered by the aircraft at the time of the accident was the last straw that broke the engine mounts back. It fractured and the engine departed the aircraft. But what about the outboard engine, engine number 4? It is highly unlikely that its attachment mount would have failed at the exact same time as the other one of engine number 3. Upon closer inspection, investigators found fatigue cracks on its mount too, but these were much less severe. Instead, they found that this engine must have been virtually ripped from its hinges when it received a blow from the side. K-1 
Can you guess what struck it? When they analyzed the outside of the engine casing, investigators found a very telling paint transfer scrape on the side of engine number 4. Its paint matched the one of engine number 3 exactly, proving something that is almost unthinkable. When engine number 3 broke away from the Boeing 707 due to its weakened hinges fracturing in the severe turbulence encounter, it flipped sideways and hit engine number 4, which in turn was ripped from its mounting points as well. Talk about bad luck. One question remains though. Why did nobody spot the fatigue cracks? Was there no inspection process to have a look at these from time to time? The answer is, yes, there was such a procedure. It had been performed in 1990, two years before the crash, before the aircraft was stored for a period of about one and a half years. On that occasion, the cracks were missed by the inspection. Over the next one and a half years, they were able to oxidize, taking up a black color. Later, when the aircraft was put back in service, it was inspected again. Here, the cracks were missed as well. Unsure whether maintenance technicians had performed sloppy work or if the procedure itself was to blame, investigators took a closer look at both. And indeed, they found that the inspection procedure itself was not adequate. It featured a visual inspection of the mounting point area. Crucially, this did not permit technicians to detect cracks in the very point where the engine bolts and the mounting points meet. This area was covered by a nut holding the engine in place. To fix this issue, the inspection procedure was revised. After all, this incident had been just one of four incidents during which a Boeing 707 had suffered an engine separation. The revised procedure now dictated the area in question must be closely inspected, which necessitates a partial disassembly of the engine mount. The final report also noted how close the crew of Transair Flight 671 came to disaster. Looking back at the accident, they realized that this crew had performed very efficiently and in great coordination. In flight, the flight engineer sent one of the passengers to the cabin to check if the wing was on fire. What he saw must have been greatly concerning, a wing that was missing two engines, sporting a sizable fuel leak and loads of dangling cables. But luckily, at that point, there was no fire. Later, the investigation found out that the fire that eventually destroyed the right wing on ground had indeed not been there while the aircraft was descending from high altitude. As the aircraft flew at high speed, fuel vapors were blown away from the aircraft quickly. Only when the aircraft performed its final turn towards the runway and slowed down, the fuel vapors combusted, most likely due to sparks caused by damaged wiring. The fire burned fiercely, causing further internal destruction inside the wing. In the end, it had burned for about two minutes before touchdown. Had it started earlier, the outcome of this event could have been catastrophic. To me, this was an amazing story about great piloting skills and team performance, luck and a happy ending, for the crew at least. The aircraft was deemed to be damaged beyond repair and was scrapped in the end. The crew, on the other hand, was highly rewarded. They received a prestigious award from the Honorable Company of Air Pilots, endorsed by the Queen and situated in London. So, what do you think about this accident? Was it skill or luck that brought these aviators back to the earth? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe and turn on the bell icon for more interesting aviation content. Thank you and see you all in the next one.